<clears throat> Thank you. Ladies, can you hear me well? Good. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the title is the Nutritional Status of GMOs. By the own admission of the biotech industry, most of our food system now contains genetically engineered food. And that's what I'm going to talk today about. So you, all hear, you came here to hear about GMOs, genetically modified organisms. And I hope you're not disappointed, but I'm going to speak for almost an hour and give you a pesticide story. We should all be concerned about the pesticide that is sprayed on the genetically engineered crops. GMOs, genetically modified organisms, in our agriculture in Canada and in the USA, all GMOs are Roundup Ready crops. All GMOs are Roundup Ready, meaning they have been engineered to be sprayed with the herbicide Roundup. <clears throat> and because I have a twisted mind, I made up this little pun. The active ingredient of the herbicide Roundup is called glyphosate. And this is what I'm going to discuss today, glyphosate. So GMOs are all glyphosate-modified organisms. That's easy to remember. So what is it? What kind of molecule is it? It's a very, very small molecule. It's an amino um, salt of phosphonic acid, not phosphoric acid. There's quite a bit of difference. Do not say glyphosate. There's no such thing as glyphosate. It is glyphosate, glycinmethylphosphonate as you can see here, a very, very small molecule. What does it do? It was invented to uh, bind to metals. That's what it does. That's what its molecule does, very small molecule, and it binds to metal, binds to metal ions, metal atoms. It was invented in 1960 by a chemical company in the USA called Stauffer Chemicals. A team of chemists uh, invented the molecule, glyphosate, and Stauffer Chemicals was in the business of cleaning up industrial pipes and boilers. When you have an electric kettle at home, after a few months of boiling water, you have mineral deposits in your kettle. And industrial pipes and boilers that have boiling water 24-7, within a few weeks or a few months, they have serious deposits of minerals on the sides of the boilers and the pipes. And it interferes with the efficiency of the systems. They need to be cleaned up. The deposits are called scales in industrial jargon. And the chemicals that are used to remove those scales are called descaling agent. And glyphosate was such an incredible chemical at the time after it was invented that Stauffer Chemical patented it. And you can read the patent. Patents are public documents. You can Google them. You can read the patent and you will read that it is a very powerful and very extremely broad spectrum descaling agent. This is what the glyphosate molecule was when it started its career, its life in 1960, patented in 1964. So there's a, a, a short list here of some of the atoms of metals that it binds to, but the list is much longer than this. It is a very broad spectrum descaling agent. After you have cleaned up your pipes and boilers, you want to replace the solution with clean water. You remove the chemical and you dispose of it somewhere. And if you dispose of it in nature, you realize very quickly that it kills plants. It kills all plants. And that's when Monsanto, the chemical company Monsanto, bought the molecule and repatented it as a herbicide in 1969. Again. Patents are public documents. So we have a descaling agent, which is, which job it is, is to bind to metals, metal iron, and remove them basically from solution and make them non-reactive, therefore bio-unavailable, which has become a herbicide. How does it work? Well, let me give you a, a quick mini lecture within this lecture. All life processes, all life processes in all cells, being bacteria, fungi, animals, plants, etc., all life processes depend on metalloproteins. We also call them enzymes. Proteins are 
usually most of them are huge molecules. Those enzymes are very complex molecules. This is a, a representation of one such molecule, a protein, metalloprotein. And they have at the center of the molecule an atom of metal. That's why they're called metalloproteins. All enzymes have an atom of metal. And I've put here MN for manganese, but it could be sulfur, iron, copper, zinc, etc. Okay? And by definition, this is what the molecule glyphosate does. It will stick bond to the atom of metal because that's what it does. That's what it was invented to do. So this molecule glyphosate binds to the atom of metal at the center of the metalloproteins. It so happens that bacteria and plants in the chloroplasts have what is called a shikimat pathway, which is a biochemical pathway, not a big one, shikimat pathway which they use to make their own amino acid, aromatic amino acid, like tryptophan, tyrosine, phenylalanine, and quite a few other molecules which are also depending on these um, aromatic amino acids. So, because the um, glyphosate binds to the manganese atom at the center of, the, of this um, enzyme, which is called the EPSP synthase, which is part of the shikimat pathway, then the shikimat pathway basically breaks down. It doesn't work anymore. The aromatic amino acids are not synthesized. The proteins cannot be synthesized, and the plants die. This is how the herbicide was deemed to work when it was patented in 1969 and registered and commercialized in 1974. That's how it works. And you can see the molecule of glyphosate here, which is bound to the atom of manganese. <clears throat> in agriculture, when you spray, or in agriculture or even in your garden, when you spray a herbicide, you spray the herbicide on the weeds and then you plant your seeds because you cannot spray a herbicide on your crops. You would kill it. That's what herbicides do. They kill plants. And glyphosate being a very broad spectrum and very powerful herbicide will kill plants. And so in 1996, when the technology Roundup Ready came on, the first crops in 1996 to be registered were soy and corn, that was an amazing feast uh, technology because now you don't have to spray your weeds anymore. You plant your seeds, never mind your weeds. And then when your seedlings are up a few weeks later, now you can spray your weeds to make sure that all your weeds have come up and you kill all your weeds. And if you've missed a few because some of them germinate later, then you can come back and spray again. It's okay, you can spray as often as you want because your crop is Roundup ready. It has been engineered with a bacterial gene to make it completely resistant to the herbicide Roundup, to the active ingredient glyphosate. So Roundup ready technology has been incredibly successful, okay? This chart shows you the progress of the technology. It starts in 1996 at zero, because this is when the first crops appeared, ending in 2014, and you can see here that we're pretty close to 100%. 100% of soy, 100% of corn, 100% of sugar beet and canola are engineered in Canada and the US. That doesn't leave much room for anything else. So there's hardly any corn or soy or sugar beet that are not engineered. It's an incredible success. Of course, if you spray a crop with any chemical, you are bound, uh, any chemical that goes inside, it does, it's not just a, a contact pesticide, it goes inside the crop, inside the plant, inside each cell of the plant, and stops the shikimat pathway, you are bound to have residues of the chemical inside the plant, normal. Nothing, nothing surprising here. What was somewhat surprising 
was that the crop, the yield from the crop contains less minerals. It's not surprising when you understand how the chemical works, because the chemical works by binding to metal atoms and basically making them unavailable. Those metal atoms have basically disappeared. So they're not there. And this is uh, a series of papers published by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Zobioli and his team work for the U.S. Department of Agriculture and published in 2010 and 2011 a series of papers showing that, yes, indeed, in soybean, there is depletion of minerals, some of them quite severe. So by definition, if the crops have been sprayed with this chemical that binds to metals, those metals are not available anymore. They are bio-unavailable. Which brings an interesting question, because in 1996, when the crops were registered to be commercialized, the concept of substantial equivalence was put forward. Yes, this is corn. It has one extra gene. It has a bacterial gene, but it really looks like corn. It grows like corn. It behaves like corn. It has exactly the same amount of protein. It tastes like corn. It is substantially equivalent. Therefore, it does not need to be tested. And the USDA has recently admitted that a bushel of corn is not what it used to be. A bushel of corn has always been 56 pounds. But the USDA knows very well that for the last 10 to 15 years, a bushel of, cor of, of corn, of engineered corn, does not weigh 56 pounds. There is two pounds missing. And so now they have changed the numbers. And now a bushel of corn, remember, almost whole corn is now engineered. So now the new weight of a bushel of corn is 54 pounds, which also brings up the same question about substantial equivalence. There's two pounds of minerals missing. The date here is 2007, but it could be 2005, it, 2010. It really is not a patent. It is a new use for the herbicide Roundup. If you, the, uh, in Canada, and I'm sure in the USA as well, of course, this is a page from the government of Saskatchewan, Guide to Farmers, and you can read herbicide options to enhance harvesting. And what that means is that the farmers, it has become perfectly normal today for the farmers to spray the crops with Roundup, with glyphosate, just before harvest. So you can spray engineered crops just before harvest if some of the weeds have come up again because the combines do not like green matter. The combines, the harvesters do not like weeds. And you can spray non-engineered crops, but if you spray non-engineered crops, you're going to kill them. One week before harvest, that's perfectly fine because that's what the farmers want to do. They want to dry the crop to make it easier and cheaper to harvest. And you can see here that wheat, oat, barley, these are cereals. None of the cereals in Canada or the USA are engineered. They have been engineered, yes, they're on the shelf. They have not been commercialized. And they are sprayed routinely with Roundup just before harvest as a desiccant. So we had a descaling agent, which became a herbicide, which became the magic herbicide, which is now sprayed on crops, as often as you want, which now has become a desiccant. And other crops, soybean, canola, beans, pulse crops, even sugarcane in the tropics, is now sprayed routinely just before harvest, because it increases the sugar content. And finally, in 2001, the chemical company Monsanto filed for a patent for glyphosate as an antibiotic. And the patent was granted in 2010. If you read the patent, you will see that one part per million kills all bacteria. And really, you can, again, patents are public documents. You can access them very easily. And you will you will read this long, long, long list of names of species of bacteria that are killed by this antibiotic. But again, this is a very powerful and very 
broad spectrum antibiotic. I guess at the time when they filed a patent, the, the company had hopes or expectation that they could market it as a pharmaceutical. It could be a very useful antibiotic. <clears throat> this was confirmed, this is published last year, by a team of researchers in Germany who looked at the effect of glyphosate on potential pathogens and beneficial members of poultry microbiota, the bacteria in the guts of poultry. All animals have bacteria in their lower intestine. All animals. Vertebrate, invertebrates, etc. So they demonstrated that, yes, indeed, one part per million is antibiotic to all kinds of bacteria in the guts of the um, hens. But what was very interesting is that Salmonella and Clostridia were not affected. They were resistant. And indeed, if you are a veterinarian, you are very aware that there are more and more epidemics of Salmonella in poultry houses. And there are more and more epidemics of Clostridium botulinum, the botulism bacteria, in cattle. And if you are a medical doctor, you are very aware that there are more and more people checking in the hospital with intestinal infection or Clostridium difficile. Difficile in French means difficult because it's basically impossible to cure using conventional antibiotic. And fortunately, there is one technique that works really well. It's called fecal transplant. Fecal transplant basically means that you take fecal matter from a very healthy person and reintroduce it into the person with a Clostridium difficile and the intestinal infection disappears. So this word microbiota, I'm going to spend a minute on that. Microbiota, the intestinal flora we have, animals have, in their lower intestine. The word has been changed by the medical establishment into microbiome. We now speak of the microbiome. We all have a microbiome. And the researcher, medical researcher, think of it as a new organ, as important as the heart or the brain. I often tell people, 10% of the cells of your body are human cells. 1% of the genes in your body are human genes. You have 100 trillion bacteria in your lower intestine and quite a few billions all over in any orifice you could even think of. We are a symbiotic organism. You think you're human. Well, you're a human shell. But those bacteria in your gut are not just there for the ride. They are speaking to each other. There are thousands of species. And we're just becoming aware of that now that the DNA, uh, analyzing DNA has become so cheap that we can do that very quickly. There is the Human Microbiome Project, which is a consortium of many universities in North America and Europe to decipher the microbiome of the human being. And this is a project that is just as big and important as the Human Genome Project was 20 years ago. So indeed, this is a very complex, I'm not going to uh, spend too much time on this, uh, on this slide, but look here, we have a brain. Oh, by the way, 100 trillion bacteria, they weigh about three to five pounds. That's just over the weight of your own brain. And here it says behavior. What do you mean? Do you mean like they could influence our behavior? Indeed, most of the neurotransmitters in your brain comes from your microbiome. 100% of the serotonin in your brain comes from your microbiome. Serotonin, I'm sure all of you know that word. It's one of the major neurotransmitters, and you know very well that if you don't have quite enough serotonin, you are depressed. And if you have less than that, you're mentally ill. So this is very serious stuff. That's the brain. And by the way, 
the connection from the brain to the microbiome, to the gut, the vagus nerve, is the most important. There's more nerve going between your brain and your intestine than all, any other organ in your body. And you thought it was just about digesting your food. It's way more than that. These bacteria, of course, the digestive system is home. So they do your digestion, they recycle everything, and they make all kinds of molecules that are absolutely essential to your health. Circulatory system, same thing. The immune system, they are 100% in charge of your immune system. The microbiome are the teachers of your immune system. Those bacteria teach your immune system how to react and when to react, etc. So this thing about asthma and allergies, that's a good sign of a damaged microbiome. Indeed, two researchers did a, last year published this paper last year, and they did a review of the medical literature and knowing with a hypothesis, with the evidence that glyphosate is antibiotic, damages the microbiome, what can we expect? Well, we can expect celiac because celiac is always associated to a damaged microbiome. And their conclusion is that celiac really, is at least the celiac epidemic of the last 15 years, really has very little to do with gluten and a lot to do with glyphosate, with the damaged microbiome. And we have known for the last several years that, of course, glyphosate binds to iron, but fine, no surprise here, but it inhibits the CYP enzymes. The cytochrome P450 enzymes are a huge family of protein, of metalloprotein. Every living cell has them. They are every living cell, like bacteria, fungi, plants, etc. 20,000 of them. But in the human body, we have 57 CYPs. And they are the first line of detoxification enzymes. They are oxidizers, most of them. And they are your detoxification system. So this is a molecule of glyphosate which impairs the microbiome and impairs, damages the microbiome by being antibiotic and impairs this CYP enzyme. Therefore, you become toxified in the long term. The two same researchers here did another review of the literature with, uh, you know, this in mind, glyphosate inhibits the CYP enzyme and damages the microbiome and what could be the consequences of that? And the conclusions are that basically glyphosate is involved or mostly responsible for the epidemic of inflammatory and degenerative diseases that we have seen come in the last 15 years. All kinds of cancer and autism and obesity and on and on. And I could show you quite a bit, but I'm just going to restrict myself here. This is from France, 2009. The human endocrine disruption at half a part per million. This is done on human cells. Another paper from the same group, apoptosis in human cells. Apoptosis is a jargon word for cell suicide, cell death. So glyphosate, because it inhibits many enzymes, kills human cells, in vitro. The same group again, a glyphosate herbicide. This is about mature rat testicular cells. And you will read in that paper that one part per million reduced testosterone by 35%. And I'm sure you all know that male fertility has gone down considerably in the last 20 years, all over the world, but mostly in the Western countries. <clears throat> This is out of Vienna in Austria, cytotoxic properties of glyphosate and Roundup in human cells. This is 2012 out of Egypt. And the conclusion here is rats fed Roundup ready corn have damaged liver and kidneys. And this is another study. This is 
a study, I'm sure some of you know about this. This is a study with exactly the same conclusion. Rats fed Roundup Ready corn have damaged liver and kidneys. This study was published in 2012. This was the first long-term feeding study by Dr. Seralini and his team, a team of toxicologists in France. And they fed the rats Roundup Ready corn for two years, the whole length of the life of a rat. And also, some of the rats were given water with some glyphosate in it. And what they observed, and they took all kinds of parameters, you know, blood and urine and what have you, weekly for two years. And it was very obvious after four months that there was damaged liver and kidneys. And then another month or two, and the rats started developing tumors. And I'm sure some of you remember those pictures that were on the internet two years ago and they still float around, of rats with huge tumors. This is from this study. Now, the biotech industry could not tolerate those pictures, and so many biotech people wrote letters to the editors, to the newspapers, and there was a huge campaign to basically vilify the study and explain how those results were not right, and these people didn't know what they were doing. Now, the biotech people are biotech people. They're not toxicologists, but that's beside the point. The point is that the chemical company Monsanto put one of their people on the editorial board of his journal, of the journal where the paper was published, and he very quickly retracted the paper. But there wasn't really much to retract other than the results were inconclusive, which is a laughable conclusion because most scientific studies are inconclusive. That's how science works. There is a small point of validity is that this was a toxicology study. If you want to do a toxicology study, you have a certain protocol to follow and you need 10 rats per treatment. If you want to do a carcinogenicity study and show cancer, you, you use a different protocol and you need 50 rats, you need a lot more sensitivity. And this was a toxicology study. Therefore, in principle, they could not conclude that there were tumors. Yet the tumors were there, and it was their duty as human beings to report on that. So the paper was retracted one year after being published in plain view of the scientific community, which to me is a new one. Never seen that happen before. And at least for inconclusive results, and of course republished in a different journal, an online journal, so that it is very public, everybody can access it, and you can look. I met Dr. Seraldini uh, two weeks ago in uh, Regina, he was there for a conference, and he spoke about his study, and he definitely stands by his results. Another paper published in, uh, at the Univ uh, University of Bangkok, showing that Glyphosate induces human breast cancer cell growth. Cancer cell proliferation is accelerated at parts per trillion to parts per billion. A part per trillion is one million times less than a part per million. So you can imagine how incredibly sensitive those cancer cells are. This is a paper published by Dr. Andre Carrasco in Buenos Aires in Argentina. Dr. Carrasco was asked to go and investigate an epidemic of birth defects in children, in babies, born with half a brain and all kinds of really, really weird uh, congenital malformations. The planes, the pampas in the Argentinas, are used to be covered in grass to grow cattle for the North American and the European market. That's all gone. Now they grow engineered soybean. And the acreage are so huge that, of course, it's all spread by airplanes. And babies are born with birth defects. And so Dr. Carrasco, who was the head of the embryology department in Buenos Aires, went to investigate, came back to his lab, injected frog embryos, frog eggs, with picoliters, extremely tiny, tiny quantities of glyphosate, and was able to replicate the birth defects he saw in humans. This is another paper published, <coughs> Birth Defects in Pigs, that was published last year. This is a team of researchers from Germany 
who fed pigs Roundup Ready corn. And when the sows gave birth to piglets, many of the piglets were deformed, again, with congenital malformations. This is the same team in Germany, in the University of Leipzig in Germany, who uh, looked for glyphosate residues in animals and humans. If you go to the um, um, website of the chemical company Monsanto, you will read that if by accident you were to ingest some glyphosate, you will flush it through the next day. It does not stick. It, it just goes through like water. And this paper tells exactly the opposite. It does stick. Not only does it stick, it bioaccumulates. And the same paper had this interesting observation. Chronically ill people have higher glyphosate residue in their urine than healthy people. This was published this year, in 2014. OK, so this is a study that was published last week by Dr. Nancy Swanson. And again, it's, it's reference number 11 on your list. Dr. Nancy Swanson published a paper. This is a, a correlation analysis. And she did a correlation analysis of two sets of data and published that. And what she did is she took two sets of data, the US, uh, one set of data from the US Center for Disease Control. The US Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, keeps a tab on the health of American citizens, how many people were diagnosed with obesity, how many people were, went to the hospital with liver damage or kidney failure this year and last year, et cetera, how many children were diagnosed on the autistic spectrum this year. And the other set of data was from the US Department of Agriculture, which of course keeps tab on the agriculture. So how many millions, millions of acres planted in anginate corn in Roundup Ready soy or corn this year, last year, et cetera. And she put the two together. The axis, showing you the incredible success of the technology, Roundup Ready soy and corn are going up and up and up, almost up to 100%, as I showed you earlier. But you would also show, and the, curves, or the, uh, the graphs all go from 20, 1990 to 2010. And you would also see that every year, this is for autism, every year there would be a bar for how many children were diagnosed on the autistic spectrum this year. And you would see that it's a pretty good fit. When you do a correlation analysis, you end up with a few numbers. One of them are called the correlation coefficient, R values. And if you have a value of one, you have a perfect fit. You are almost demonstrating causation. When you have a value of 0 0.9, 0 0.95, 0 0.99, this is a very high correlation coefficient value. It basically tells you there is a link. It tells scientists who do this sort of statistical analysis this is where you should look. This is where you want to dig and do some experiments or somehow make it clearer. There is a link. There is a linkage. Statistical analysis, form of statistical analysis, the correlation analysis, has a weakness. The weakness is that you could replace one of the sets of data with something else and come up with the same correlation coefficient. And you could say, well, that, that becomes meaningless then. And for example, I get this reaction from the biotech people often. Autism is obviously caused by organic food. <laughs> Therefore, the whole paper, everything should be thrown out, which is a very unscientific stance. If you're a scientist and you do this, you are looking for a link, for a finger pointing at something. There's a link between the two sets of data. And saying that, oh, it is a coincidence, or you can do this, is, is absolutely meaningless and a very unscientific stance. I get this from time to time. <clears throat> This is a summary of the results of Dr. Swanson's analysis. Roundup ready soy and corn and autism, the correlation coefficients are here. 
This is what you were looking at earlier, and you can look at celiac, intestinal infection, all kinds of cancer, kidney failure, diabetes, obesity, dementia, and there's quite a few others. So basically, her correlation analysis is illustrating the link that was postulated or suggested or shown by earlier papers that I showed you today. This is a paper from Dr. Kaplan, her team. She is a psychiatrist in Calgary. She works at the University Hospital in Calgary. She does what she calls nutritional psychiatry. She works with autistic children, and she feeds them mineral supplements, and they get better quickly. These numbers are from the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. I don't know what the numbers are in Canada, but I assume they're quite similar, since we are very much in harmony. Harmonization is the word. Uh, the EPA in, in 2013 raised the legal residues of glyphosate in foods considerably by a factor of two or 10 or 100, depending. There were no studies done, just because the new, just to accommodate the new reality of the residues of glyphosate going up in the food significantly because the technology is so successful that glyphosate has become a really serious contaminant in the food system. And this is from the EPA website. You, there is a page, several pages, on basic information about glyphosate in drinking water, and you will read that the maximum contaminant level is 0.7 milligram per liter. And a little uh, further on the page, you will read this, that people drinking water containing more than 0.7 parts per million of glyphosate may develop kidney problems and infertility. And what I've shown you today is that there's a whole host of other symptoms that would appear when you become contaminated, uh, how, whatever use you want, whatever word you want to use, uh, with glyphosate. <clears throat> this is my last slide. And this is basically the state of the world today. Because in North America, we're a bit in a biotech bubble, and we think the world is like here. But it isn't at all. In white are the countries that have absolutely no regulation of Roundup. Remember what I said earlier, Roundup was registered in 1974. Glyphosate was registered in 1974 as completely innocuous. It has no acute toxicity, therefore it is absolutely safe. There is absolutely no need to regulate it at all. Nobody at the time even thought that because of its chemistry, because of how it works, there may be some chronic implication for health in humans and animals. In orange are all the countries that have some legislation, some regulation, some form of regulation. Oftentimes, it is labeling in the food stores. And in red, the countries with a red dot are the dozen countries or so that have banned the technology. There is no Roundup Ready crops grown in those countries. There is no Roundup Ready food imported in those countries. And there is no need for labeling. Thank you very much.